Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 17. We're going to apply the variational method in a couple of contexts, and we're going to talk about some homework problems. Um, this is the last lesson before the next exam, which will be lesson 19. Uh, lesson 18, of course, is just going to be our wrap-up and review, so there's no formal new material that day. It's all about getting you guys ready to, uh, to take an exam about this stuff. So let's uh, march ahead. I want to mention Computing Project 5, which won't be due till after the exam, is the application of the variational method to some problem of your choice. Now, the, uh, the handout is written up uh, about the helium atom, but uh, in the spirit of broadening the scope of these things and giving you guys more choice about what you do, I was going to suggest that you could also study the hydrogen uh, n the negative hydrogen ion, that's a hydrogen atom, a proton basically, with one extra electron. Uh, there's a homework problem about that. Uh, in fact, there are a couple that relate to that. Then there's the lithium plus ion. Notice that all three of these, the helium atom, the negative hydrogen ion, and the positively charged lithium ion are all systems with a nucleus and two electrons. So they have a lot in common, uh, but they are different systems. And uh, Another one that might be interesting is the hydrogen molecular ion. So that would be two protons, not in the same nucleus, but two separated by some distance, that share only one electron. So we have two protons sharing a single electron. That's another case that we can handle with the variational method. We're going to handle. We're going to look at the neutral hydrogen molecule for project eight. Uh, at least that's my proposed. Uh, context, but uh, we'll get to that later. Anyway, in this time, and, and look, if there's another system that you're interested in that you can attack with the variational method, then uh, go right ahead and do it, and I will accept that as your competing project five. So as long as you're applying the variational method in some way, uh, you're good. Okay, let's talk about a homework problem. This is extending the problem we did for the last homework. Now, for the last homework, what you did was you took the infinite square well, which is our old buddy, and you added a potential, which was uh, anti-symmetric about the midpoint of the infinite square well. And you computed the uh, perturbed wave function and the perturbed energy of that system using non-degenerate perturbation theory. That was the idea. What I want to have you guys do now is to attack the same problem as a variational method problem. So the idea is you think of the wave function as a little bit of the ground state plus, or mostly the ground state, it's almost all the ground state, plus a little tiny bit of the first excited state. And how can you think of that as a variational method? Well, you can think of it as a variational method by imagining ex computing the expectation value of the Hamiltonian minimizing it with respect to variation in the parameter beta. Now, one thing about the variational method, it's extremely important that you normalize the wave function. When we worked out the wave function for the degenerate perturbation theory, we didn't worry too much about normalizing in the end. We just said it was, it was the ground state plus some dimensionless parameter times the first excited state. Um, it turns out the normalization is uh, 1 over the square root of 1 plus beta squared. But uh, we didn't worry about working that out. We could get the energy without worrying about the normalization. We got a correct value for the first order correction to the energy uh, without worrying about the normalization constant. And the reason is that the normalization constant is second order in beta. As you can see, it's got a beta squared in it. But when we're using the variational method, the fact that the parameter shows up in the normal normalization constant turns out to be important. Uh, you need to compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian to second order in beta so that when you minimize it by taking the derivative you'll have something uh, useful <laughs> left over. You can't, you can't minimize a linear function of beta. It's got to be at least quadratic in order to get a minimum. So you have to keep beta up to second order and it does make a difference. So um, that's the idea. You keep terms in the expectation value of the Hamiltonian up to second order in beta. If you keep all orders of beta, it, it's kind of a hideous expression 
and uh, you don't really learn a whole lot. <coughs> Excuse me, you don't learn a whole lot more anyway. Uh, if you if you wanted to go to higher order in beta, you'd have to include the uh, n equals three state and other things that make it more complicated. So I want to keep it simple, but you can't keep it uh, you can't keep it that simple. You have to go up at least to second order in beta. What I want you to do is to show that beta turns out to be alpha o divided by three times the energy of the ground state. That's the same result we got with degenerate perturbation theory, so that's comforting. You can also um, show that the energy that you wind up with turns out to be the ground state energy minus alpha squared over three times the ground state energy. In other words, by adding this potential and, uh, and having this perturbation take effect, the energy is actually lowered from the uh, ground state energy. Now, um, I want to think about this a little bit. What is it that's exactly happening? Um, you could think of it as a trade-off of kinetic energy to potential energy. If you turn up beta, what are we actually doing? We're incorporating some of the first excited state. Notice that the first excited state is the sine function that has two antinodes. It's got one on the left of the center and one on the right of the center. And if you turn that up, it's going to shift the probability distribution to the left. By shifting the probability distribution to the left, we go down in potential energy because the potential energy is lower on the left than it is on the right. So by that logic, you'd want beta to be as big as you could get it. The problem is that beta is the amplitude of being in the n equals 2 state. And of course, the n equals 2 state has four times the kinetic energy of the n equals 1 state. So by turning beta up, we're going down in potential energy, but we're going up in kinetic energy. And so the minimum total energy happens when beta has just the right value to minimize the Hamiltonian expectation value. And of course, that is when beta is equal to alpha divided by three times the ground state energy, as we showed. Uh, but, it, but we didn't treat it in the perturbation theory. We didn't treat it as a minimization problem. But you can see that uh, using the variational principle, you get the same result. But you can think of it as minimizing the expectation value of the total energy. In other words, we got a new ground state with a lower energy than the original ground state. But that ain't all, because there's another way we can attack this problem. We can treat it as an eigenvalue problem. So I'd like you to do that as the second part of the homework. I want you to show using the unperturbed states as a basis. In other words, the ground state and the first excited state, n equals 1 and n equals 2, show that you can write the Hamiltonian this way, um, where alpha is the same definition we used before. It's, the, it's minus the a matrix element between n equals 2 and n equals 1 with the perturbation. Uh, and what you have to do is find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What you can show is that the eigenvector is uh, the ground state plus beta times the first excited state. And if you want to normalize it, you can, but you don't have to. I mean, uh, the eigenvectors, of course, are uh, eigenvectors regardless of normalization. And what you can show is that the eigenvector has the property that beta is alpha divided by 3e1, again, same result, and that the energy of the low, now when you get eigenvectors, you're going to get two eigenvectors and two eigenvalues. We're really only interested in the ground state, the new ground state, so we want to look at the low energy eigenvector and the low energy eigenvalue. You can also learn by studying this that the first excited state also gets shifted, but it gets shifted up by the perturbation. And uh, that also kind of makes sense if you think about it, but uh, we don't have to think about it right now. Right now, I just want you to focus on what happens to the ground state, what happens to the energy of the ground state, and what happens to the uh, composition of the ground state in terms of the unperturbed states. And so for board work today, we'll get started on these two problems. Hopefully we can make some decent progress and we can also talk about the computing project. We can talk about what's bothering you guys and stuff like that. But that is the job for today. To see you next time.